Hello from Blue Willow Bookshop in Houston, Texas. My name is Kathy Berner, and I am the event coordinator here at the shop. We are so excited to host this virtual event hosting David Atherton in celebration of his new cookbook, David Atherton's Baking Book for Kids. Join me in welcoming David to the screen. Hello. Hi, David. How are you? Very good, thank you. How are you doing? I am great, and I am so excited to be here with you. This is, I'm just delighted. As you know, I'm a huge fan of all of your endeavors, and I'm really excited to talk to you about your new baking book for kids. Yes. <laughs> and I just have to say thank you for doing this on a weekend when you have actually moved house. Yeah, I mean, the weekend's fine. I love working on the weekend. Oh, it's not, this isn't work anyway. But um, yeah, we did just move house. And leading up to this, so I don't know what it's like in the US, but when you move house in the UK, trying to get your Wi-Fi connected, <laughs> it's usually about two weeks. And I don't know, my husband, Nick, is a magician. He managed to get it set up on the, on the first day because I did think that I might have to pop around to a friend's house to do this. Well, cheers to Nick. That's very well done of him. So as I told you, I want to start this off by doing a little bit of show and tell. Um, this, obviously, is your beautiful book. This is the cookbook that I used with my children when they were young. Um, and it's written by Molly Katzen, uh, U.S viewers might know her from the Moosewood cookbook, which was a very famous plant-based cookbook that still remains popular. And then this gem was my cookbook when I was a child, the nice. Betty Crocker New Boys and Girls cookbook with just, I mean, look at that, macaroni and cheese with hot dogs. That was one of the meals. <laughs> We've I moved a little forward. Loads of people have one of these books. So now I remember when when I go to events, a lot of people say, oh, I remember my first cookbook when I was a kid. Um, and often they're not that great. I had one. Do you have Usborne in the US? We do. Yeah, we had an Usborne one called, um, I forgot what it was called actually, but it had crafts in it as well. It was food and crafts. And I loved that book. And looking back at it, it probably wasn't that great, but um, I just loved it. I think, and I think like I look back at this and the Betty Cracker one, and it wasn't great, but it got me started interested. It got me interested in cooking. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I think that's my thing for kids' cookbooks. Like I, as you know, I'm a health um, professional, so I really like healthy food. And just It's just always been a personal passion of mine anyway, into healthy food. But with kids, I don't think it's that, I mean, you can choose how to feed them, but I think the most important thing is just learning to enjoy being in the kitchen and making food because then at least you know what's going into your body, you know what you're cooking or baking with, and you know what you're feeding yourself. Um, so you yeah, see, for me, it's just about getting that connection with kids to enjoy the kitchen. I completely agree with you, and I think you did a wonderful job in it. I mean, this is, I've, I've cooked probably at least half a dozen items from the cookbook, and this morning I made the no-bake bars again because I love them so much. Nice. They remind me of a Cadbury fruit and nut bar, Oh, yes. Yeah. Which um, I do love. <laughs> and, and, and this time, uh, thanks to one of my dear friends who I believe is watching, I, I did half golden raisins and half dried apricots. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the thing in the book that I like the most. I, I really enjoyed writing the, like the blurb, the, the introductions to the recipes. Right. And one of the things is it's nice to be able to tell people, like, as, even as a child, I wanted to be one of those people that as I followed the recipe, I'm like, oh, I'm going to try putting this spice in. Or, oh, it says to put hazelnut, I'm going to put almonds in. Um, and I think that's really important. And a lot of the recipes in this book are the kind of ones where you can switch in and out your favorite things. I find it quite strange when sometimes people say, oh, I don't like raisins. It's, well, you know, you can just use apricots. Like, <laughs> not, it's not that difficult. Um, but yeah, I, I love the fact that people are swapping in out ingredients. And actually, I didn't, I had... I tend to be a cook who follows the recipe pretty closely, but your your cookbooks, your whole series of cookbooks for kids has made me think more about the fact that I do have the freedom to swap things out. Yeah, you know, I even wanted to be more explicit a lot of the time. I wanted, but then it's, when you're speaking to your editor and um, the way publishing works, uh, sometimes people say, no, that's not a very good idea, David. But I liked the idea of saying just citrus and then letting the kids choose 
oranges, lemons, limes, grapefruits, yuzu, whatever they've got, if you're doing a zest. Um, but they said, no, it's better to put it in little extra boxes. But yeah, that to me, that is the point that I want the kids, the reason why the book's illustrated is I want the kids to be the ones that are in charge, or at least think they're in charge. Uh, so then you've got all the pictures. So even if they can't read, they're the ones that can follow the step by step. They can lead it. And I want them to feel that in the same way as thinking, OK, it says orange zest, but actually I really like lemon. I want to try lemon zest for my recipe. Um, and I would have loved actually to also have space where kids could have written notes to make the recipe, how to make the recipe their own, which maybe will be a yeah, future book. That would be really cool. That would be really, really cool. I love that idea. And I think all of this from the pictures to the encouraging substitution of ingredients encourages kids to take ownership of this process, which kind of goes back to what one of your goals was. Yeah, and it's it's there's so many levels to that as well. One of the things that I found so often when I was um, cooking or baking with friends, kids and family is that kids that don't like certain things, if they've taken ownership of the recipe, they will usually at least try it. So if a child says, oh, I don't really like spinach, I don't like spinach, and then you make like some spinach pancakes, they will probably try them if they've been the ones leading the recipe and making them uh, because, yeah, they've got ownership over it. So I think, yeah, there's so many. And I also even think with cleaning, and washing up and things, often if they've been the one in charge and you're saying like, oh, you're the head chef, then they'll want to be part of the whole process, um, which is what, yeah, it's what I found. Yeah. And I think that's a great idea. So you mentioned cooking with children. Did you, how did you test your recipes with them? And did you test your recipes with them? Yeah, often I wrote the recipes um, with friends, kids, but the great thing, Walker Books, so Walker is, Candlewick and Walker are kind of the same company, but the US and the British version, I don't know why they've got a different name, um, but Walker Books, um, the way they decided to do the testing is the staff at Walker Books, so not, because often it gets sent to a, a home economist who right. just goes through all of the recipes in the book and makes notes and things like that. But I don't think that's necessarily that helpful because these guys are all super bakers. Whereas if you really want to check how robust the recipe is, Walker Books just gave the recipes, a single recipe to each person in the office who had kids um, and paid for their ingredients and then asked them to do it. And they had a feedback form and they could feed back, things back. And it was sometimes funny way they would say, oh, this didn't work. And then I would read further down and they said, well, yeah, it didn't work because you used the double the size tin because you didn't have the right tin <laughs> Strangely enough, it's not going to work if you do that. Um, but yeah, like it was really great because real, real families with real kids tested all the recipes multiple times. And then also the reason why, so this David Athlon's Baking Book for Kids, this is actually um, one year later to the release in the UK. Right. In the UK, it has a different name, uh, but it's essentially exactly the same book. It's just Panel Away were really good with their integrity in wanting to make sure they've tested all the recipes. Because it's not even just changing the measurements, the cut measurements and teaspoons that we tend to use grams uh, with scales in the UK. It's actually also the ingredients. Like yes. you have your all-purpose flour is actually slightly different to our plain flour. They're not quite comparable in their protein content. So you do have to test the recipe. And so often publishers are a little bit lazy. And if there's a, a British book that they're going to convert to a US one, they just convert the measurements. They don't actually test the recipes. Um, but yeah, the Candlewick team, it took a year because they fully tested all the recipes again in the US. I love that. And I remember when I cooked, when I did the flapjack recipe, the British flapjack recipe, as opposed to the American flapjack pancake recipe, um, I messaged you. I'm like, I've, we don't have muesli here. And you were like, really? I think we do. And then I looked and yes, H-E-B carries muesli. So I did not know that. And now I do. And I can make flapjacks whenever I want. It is a strange thing, isn't it? Because I found this out with, um, so my, the very first, oh, actually I need to go back to the very first conversation you said when you're talking about old cookbooks. The, the way the first book I did came about was that my, one of my best friends, Rachel Stubbs, um, is a children's book illustrator. Uh, and she'd done a book with Walker Books. Called The Red Hat. Asked her, yes, yes. And they asked her to come back and just pitch a couple of ideas. And it just happened to be at a time when I was currently filming for Bake Off. Um, so she, she told them, she was like, oh, and there's these ideas. And also uh, my friends on, on, oh no, we'd finished filming, sorry, but it hadn't gone onto the TV yet, it hadn't been transmission. And she's like, oh, my friend uh, is currently on Bake Off. And they were very excited because they'd been waiting for a long time to do this cookbook. 
Uh, and the publisher in particular, she wanted a man because it's usually women that write these books. And she had her book from the 1950s that she'd used. She still had the exact copy, uh, which was all step-by-step -step illustrations. So then it was this kind of merger with our ideas and her original 1950s book, which was huge. Like the UK versions of these books are a lot bigger than the US ones. Uh, which, yeah, I'm not sure it's great uh, financially for them, but she really wanted it the same size. Uh, but yeah, I just love the fact that it's got that history that it actually has come from one of those first books. And that's why we called it as well. The first one that we did was My First Cookbook, which had a different name in the US, um, but yeah, it did come from the same place. I love that origin story. I think that's fantastic because I, with fiction as well as with nonfiction, I think when an idea comes organically like this one did it it just it tends to be better quality across the board yes and now i remember what you were talking about what i was going to refer to is when i did the book i remember rachel her first book um got the rights were bought in so many different languages around the world uh, and then i was told oh with cookbooks it's different because things don't translate as well you can just translate a story um, and the characters quite easily but for example if you use sweet potato in a recipe then there'll be countries in the world that don't use sweet potatoes. Like uh, my husband's sister lives in Germany and we went there. You can't find sweet potatoes in the shop or you can't find, we use a lot of butternut squash. Uh -huh. uh, and butternut squash is like a type of pumpkin right. uh, from the same family. But in Germany, they don't have butternut squash anywhere. So she was saying, oh, what, what would I use? And when, so, when all the illustrations have already been drawn, it's very difficult for them to just change the name and say pumpkin. Um, oh, but luckily, yeah. the UK and the US, we do share. There's been a few things where the publisher said, oh, what is this? Like, we've got no idea what this is. Uh, but in general, and like Muesli maybe is more common in the UK. Uh, but in general, I think we do share quite a lot across the US, the US and the UK. That's a really great point that I had not thought about when it's illustrated, especially. Mm. That is going to cause a challenge. And so speaking of illustrations, all three of your, uh, all three of the books that are released in the U.S. are illustrated by different, very talented illustrators. Did yeah. they? Did any of them cook the recipes before they illustrated? <laughs> very interesting, actually. Rachel, um, obviously being one of my best friends, and her son Rowan, um, we Nick and I love hanging out with Rowan, and so we did some of the recipes with Rowan. Um, with Alice, who, these were all such nice links. Alice actually just lived just up the road from me. Um, she didn't do the recipes as much. That She was very, very busy at the time and she was struggling to like finish all the artwork and die. Right. Um, but then Harry, for this book, Harry particularly loved Bake Off. Um, and so they did do a lot of the recipes. Um, and in some ways, some of their illustrations, because I, I bake them and then I take photos of them, um, and then they get to see, see the photos. Okay, the, okay. Some of Harry's illustrations um, were slightly different. I was like, oh, I wonder if they baked them their way and then they've drawn them from their own their own bake, which I just loved. I did. Okay, so that made, I have a question about the um, the lemon drizzle cake. Mm. In, in, and you just, one of the ingredients is um, ground up oats. In I'm guessing yes. that's in substitution of part of the flour. Yes, yes. So, a, why did you decide to do that as a, instead of going to like whole wheat flour? And B, how many times do you have to test to figure out what the correct balance is? Yeah, that's that's the toughest thing I think with recipes. Like coming, up, I love the stage of coming up with ideas, uh, but my personality isn't the kind of personality that loves to kind of. I'm not a perfectionist. I don't like to just keep on tweaking and testing things a million times. Okay. I love it when a recipe works. Often, if something doesn't work, if I've tried it a couple of times, I actually just think, oh, I'll think it's something completely different. I'll try something new. Um, with that, I you use oats in a cake if you want a slightly chewier texture. Mm -hmm. um, and for a lemon drizzle loaf, some people go for a really soft, like Madeira cake style. But I like it to be a little bit chewy. Um, and you can use whole oats, actually. It's just then you have a slightly different texture again. Right. Um, but I did do it a few times. And this is the thing with, with kids' recipes. Recipes are very different depending on the ingredients you use. And actually just different oats from different parts of the world might act slightly differently in a cake. 
Um, but with kids' recipes, you're always trying to think of really robust recipes that actually it doesn't matter if you put too much milk or you dropped half your flour on the floor or something. It might not be perfect each time, but the, the thing I like about kids' recipes is there's not as much jeopardy. It's kind of like, okay, these are going to work anyway, even if, yeah, it's not perfect. And I think that I love that approach, number one. And number two, that, again, bleeds over into making children comfortable in the kitchen. Yes. Making yeah. it okay. Perfection is not the goal here. Yeah, the goal no, is you, something tasty. Yes. If you see me in the kitchen with kids, I am one of those people. I don't mind if they make a mess. I want them to be the ones like using the spoon. I like kids from such a young age. I want to see them try to crack an egg. They're never going to learn to crack an egg if they don't start. Um, I've got friends who are 30 who still can't crack eggs, but they obviously wouldn't let them allowed to do it by their mums. So yeah, I think really allowing the kids to have control, and it's really tough to do. And if you don't do that, kids are not going to enjoy the kitchen. If you're too controlling and you tell them off, if they're like, oh, you spill that everywhere, then they're not going to enjoy the kitchen. So it's really important to know if you're going to do some baking or cooking with kids, you know it's going to take twice as long. You know it's going to create more mess. Um, and more hassle but you've got to see it more as an activity rather than thinking of just getting the thing at the end of it well and not only that but I'm thinking I cooked with my children when they were young and now when they come home for a holiday they pitch in and there's participation in the kitchen and yeah, I mean, the kitchen. then you're making a meal together and the joy of that cannot be understated yeah, we came from, I, there's seven people in my family and we had a very small house. It was a very big garden, which we liked, but a very small house. And for that reason, the kitchen probably was, we were always in the kitchen, all of us, all the time um, and just doing things. So it's really, to me, it's like the, the highest form of community is uh, being in the kitchen with people, cooking and baking together. Like I don't, you know, there's people that like to cook, but they don't want anyone to interfere. I do not mind at all. I don't mind people stirring my pan. I'll, I'll give people jobs to do. I, to me, a kitchen is community. I completely agree with you. And just thinking about when I've seen friends who I haven't been with for a long time when we're all in the same place and we're making a meal together or just eating breakfast and even fixing our own things together, but we're together and sharing a meal, it is some of the most basic and most beautiful forms of community. Yeah, and that's why I think with the illustrations, I wanted it to kind of feel like that in the pictures. So it wasn't just a, it wasn't just pictures of oh here's a child making some brownies and then here's a finished plate of brownies. I wanted it to be. I kept on telling Harry like I want you to have the kids playing afterwards, eating the food or having fun while doing it. And yeah, and that to me is also really important to show that for the kids themselves. In fact. The original idea for this book, which didn't move forward, was I wanted um, there to be a street of families, oh. all different kinds of families, and then them to be making like each recipe. Or not, there may be four of the recipes will be from one family throughout the book, um, and but the families would be very different as well. There might be um, two mums, and there might one of them could be like a, a nursery teacher who does who has kids coming to her house to look after kids. And things um, and obviously all all diverse all everything and then right at the end i wanted there to be a big street party spread of <laughs> them all making the food and bringing it together um but yeah even in the book still i think i hope that there's good representation and diversity in all of the there is and there is in all in all three illustrations and exactly angela you jumped ahead of me okay david that's a picture book idea yes uh, with, no seriously that is a picture book idea and then you have in your back matter you have one or two recipes from please write that book yes that would, I would be so love great that. <laughs> okay i'll call walker books <laughs> yes yeah but that's no that's a fantastic idea and i'm thinking i'm sure there may be one or two in the u.s but there that's not a hugely common thing and i think that that would be a wonderful book mm. yeah i would love to do that book I've got way too many ideas for books in my head. That's the problem. <laughs> but that's wonderful. So do you have, um, like, do you keep track of that in some way? Is it just in your head? Do you have a, a journal, like, where you're writing down ideas? Do you do it on your phone? How do you keep track? Yeah, I've got a journal that I write them in, um, all the ideas. I have to say, if I'm honest, because I'm quite an honest person, I don't like, um, 
I don't know, I'm, I'm an overture and I like to be honest. Um, I quite often pitched different ideas. Every time a new, I, I speak to what about doing a new book, and the thing is, it always comes back to the sales team and the editorial team wanting to be very safe nowadays and saying, oh, can we just do this one again? Can we, can we try this instead? Because I, yeah, I quite often have pushed every single time they've asked me, I've actually probably pushed for a slightly different book that was maybe doing a little bit more. Um, and each time they kind of rein me back into, um, well, to what the books I've got, which I have loved doing them, um, but a little bit more, a little bit safer um, and a little bit more of just a typical recipe book. But I got all those ideas, um, and yeah, one day I'll push one through. That is wonderful, and I—I I mean, it is publishing is a business, yeah. So I do understand the per—I do understand the publisher's perspective because it is those margins are not very wide; those are tight margins, and uh, in order to be sustainable, you do have to make some of those decisions. But I think risks are sometimes very much worth it. I mean, especially for color, color picture books as well. It's like the margins are even smaller. And I really respect it. Like, I think my name is on the book, but it's not my book. Like anyone that works in publishing or um, in bookshops and knows about publishing, you guys know, like there are so many people that make right. the book. Uh, and it's not my decision. It's not my idea. It's all about this balance. And I wouldn't want to proceed if I wasn't happy with what I'm doing, but I've always been happy with the books that we've, that we've produced. Um, but yeah, you it would be very arrogant to think that I would just push something through because I don't have that expertise. And um, there's a huge teams of people that, you know, work in those areas. So I, yeah, I massively respect them and respect their ideas. I do think that sometimes there's times when, and Walker Books isn't like this. Walker Books definitely, um, they, they're not safe all the time. I think it's just maybe being with me, they've been a bit safer. Um, but yeah, you do have to sometimes push it, don't you? And be a bit brave and risk it for the fact that like a book really hits off. And it's a bit different because if you're always just going to be very, very safe with every single book, then it's going to be a bit vanilla, I think. I think you're right. Oh, I love um, vanilla. Love exactly. Vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in in this book, how do you decide what healthy changes you're going to make to a recipe? Like in the flapjack recipe, you mix the butter and the corn syrup and then you soften dates in it and blitz that. and like I could have just eaten that, which I realize is not a healthy choice. But oh my gosh, that was so delicious. Yeah, do you know what? It's a really tough thing because this whole thing with health, I find, and this isn't a flippant thing to say because it obviously is a very serious problem, especially in the US and the UK. Yeah. But we have now started equating health with weight loss and with trying not to be too calorific. That's actually not necessarily healthy. Yes. Like, Health for me, and to me, so like the flat, if you go back to the flatbread recipe, the healthy thing about a flatbread recipe is the fact that it's stuffed full of nuts and seeds and dried fruits. Like the fact that there's butter and corn syrup still in it, that's fine because it should be a sweet treat. Like I don't want to preach to people about the fact of not having anything sweet and trying to turn everything into like a real, like overly healthy thing. Because right. to me, I don't live my life like that. I know some people do but I eat very, very healthily. And then I have a sweet treat and I have it in moderation. I have it just, you know, I just wouldn't eat a whole tray of flapjacks. Um, but I think if we, I've got some friends that are obsessed with calories and therefore they don't eat avocados. They don't eat nuts and seeds because they think, oh, these are really, really rich, but they are healthy. So often for me, it's trying to, especially for kids as well, it's trying to get people to give them real things. Uh, and like the whole wheat flour, you can make bread that has 50% of whole wheat flour in it it's not going to be the nicest, fluffiest bread. Kids probably aren't going to enjoy eating it very much. And actually, you don't need such a high percentage to feed the good bacteria in your guts. Um, you only need to have like a 10% um, whole wheat flour. So yeah, I think I, I'm always battling this because my I still probably would go more to making them even, even more healthy. That would be my taste because I think I just grew up with that from my mom. Right. Um, but I'm always fighting for that. No, this has got to still be something that people enjoy and that people that can be a really nice sweet treat um and some of the recipes probably are skewed the more the healthy then other ones are skewed more to kind of sweet treats and then just trying to do additions like nuts and seeds and things and i think it's a great balance and again the it's modeling adding it's it's modeling a whole attitude towards food consumption yes you want it to be healthy and yes you want it to fuel you and in moderation a sweet treat is fine. 
Yeah. And it goes back to the most important thing for me is people understanding what's in their food. Even yes. from like I knew because I made so many cakes when I was a kid, there was never this revelation where I was like, whoa, you put all this sugar in a cake. It's like, I knew that. So I even when I was younger, I'd only have, you know, you, you know it's a slice of cake is a treat. Um, I was a, I was running a cookery course last year, uh, last year, last week, and um, there was some people there and we made eggs benedict. And two of the women there were shocked when we made the hollandaise because anytime they'd been somewhere while their husbands were having these big um big fatty breakfasts they were having eggs benedict thinking that they were having the healthy option not realizing that hollandaise <laughs> literally just egg yolk and butter that's all it is and then it's like swamping all over the dish and it's like it's, it's that kind of thing for me it's like people just need to have an informed view of what they're eating i love a croissant but I'm not going to eat five because I make them and I know exactly how much butter goes into a croissant. Um, so yeah, just from a such young age, teaching kids to enjoy being in the kitchen and then just hopefully that will go through that they just know what's in food as they get to adulthood. I think that's such a great attitude. And I think the more, the more we know that, the more children know that, I think generally the healthier we're all going to be. Yeah, yeah. So I want to switch... Um, because we've spent so much time talking about this glorious book. I want to talk a little bit about Bake Off. Um, why did you originally apply? Ooh. I'm, if you live in the UK and you like baking, you will just have your family and friends always telling you, oh, you need to apply for Bake Off, you need to apply. And I spent 10 years holding back just because I didn't want to be on TV. Like, I loved the idea of baking, and doing like a baking competition, but I never really wanted to go on TV. Um, and I think it probably just got to the point, I, the job that I was doing, I couldn't see a promotion. I just done another course, like, you know, when you just do another master's degree or something. Yeah. And I then was just looking for the next thing, thinking, oh, I enjoy my job, but it's a bit, it's getting a bit samey. I need something just to kind of inject a bit of excitement. So I started looking around and then the applications for Bake Off came out and I was like, oh, I'd been at my pottery class the night before. And they were all, I always took a bake to pottery and they again said that like, you have to apply now. It's this year's finished and they've just put the application, you have to apply. And so I did it just as a, a thing where I was thinking, oh, I'm just going to start applying just for things. This will be the first thing I apply for. Um, and yeah, you just go through the audition process is severe, like it's quite intense. Uh, and you just go through round after round. And I never thought, because it's kind of a lottery to get onto Bake Off in the UK, over they think of between 20 and 30,000 people apply and only 12 or 13 in area get on. So it really is a lot of, you don't expect to get on. Oh, I, I don't know whose brain will be if they thought they were going to get on when they apply. You just apply thinking. It's very speculative. Oh, I'll just see, just see how it goes. Um, but yeah, it just kept on going through <laughs> round after round. Is there something that Bake Off taught you or like an experience that you didn't expect to have, you know, that that came out of it? I think one thing it taught me was I tend to lean into things that I'm good at. I didn't like looking. I'm not a perfectionist. I think people used to always say, oh, Dave, you're such a perfectionist. I'm not a perfectionist, but I will only do things, show people things that I've done well in, <laughs> that, that, that look good or that taste nice. Like, I think I that's, human no that, that's human nature. Yeah, but I've got friends who will bake something and they'll bring it to work and they'll say, oh, I burnt all the edges of these ones. But if you chop that off, they're still really tasty. I would never have done that. I will bring them in and say, oh, I might have overbaked these ones, but actually they'll be perfect. <laughs> so if, if I if I burn the edges, they're, they're going in the bin. So I, I've always needed to start. And I, the thing I loved about Bake Off was because you were on TV under the pressure, it definitely taught me to be more vulnerable and to just put myself out there more and not worry about what people think about as much. Especially because also you know that the TV editing team, they can do what they want with that edit. You don't have control over what you look like, how you're going to come across. Um, so that was a really good lesson for me, I think. I will say the thing that struck me, and I'm sure hundreds of people, if not thousands of people have said this to you, is how calm and centered you were. <laughs> yes, yeah. Just, and, you know, it would be chaos all around you, and you just simply moved through and that was an interesting contrast but it was also you know so delightful to see your success I think getting on to Bake Off as a success but to see you chosen as the winner was just all the sweeter 
Yeah, I think it sounds very strange, but I'm not a competitive person at all. And when I say at all, like I genuinely am not. I don't even like playing games if people are taking it too seriously and competitive. I just don't want to play now because I just don't find that kind of thing. But, right. Um, and going on to Bake Off, I didn't see it as a baking competition as in competing with other bakers. I thought, I, I don't mind, I'm not even very good at competing with myself. Like I if I do exercise, I need something else to drive me because I just don't have that brain where it's like, oh, you need to beat your sore from last time. I'm like, I just don't really care. Um, but Bake Off, I just enjoyed the whole process. And I so I think my thing is, I saw it as a win to get on the program, where right. I realized a lot of people that go on the show are desperately wanting to win. They're desperately wanting to get right to the end. And the skills of Bake Off, anyone that gets on that show can bake. If you could see the bakes that they have to show to be able to get onto the program, that they can all bake. That's not the skills of Bake Off. The skills of Bake Off is being able to bake incredibly quickly, is being able to multitask, because there's someone talking to you with cameras on you the whole time and being able to roll with it if it goes wrong. And a lot of people that crash out in the first weeks, that's their issue. They haven't realized that, first of all, they don't do well with time pressure or, you know, if something goes wrong, they just spiral. Whereas I think maybe because some of the jobs I've done in the past and just my personality, I am quite level-headed. I don't really go in those sort of peaks and troughs. Um, so I just enjoyed each week. Um, and I didn't mind if something didn't, really turn out that well there was one time i remember being very frustrated but the other times i kind of found it more funny but also i did also recognize that bake off as a tv show the success isn't about winning like the most successful people from bake off are the people of the public love um so i also knew that the competition wasn't just about winning each week and winning at the end yeah that's that's fair um is there so speaking of bakes was there one bake in that series that you especially enjoyed Ooh, there's probably, I enjoyed making my cinnamon rolls. In <laughs> and what, it doesn't, what you don't see on that, I was, this is my thing, Kathy. You said that like, I was always so calm. I was always so ahead of time. I just work incredibly quickly. And with that one, what you don't actually see on the, the program at all, I was so far ahead um, that I told Sandy, I'm just going to make a batch of cinnamon rolls for the crew. And I actually made a whole other batch in the middle of the challenge, <laughs> actually the camera people and Sandy and Henry came over to my bench and tried one as well. Uh, so that was probably my most fun one because I felt like I was just playing around in that one. That Well, that is, my friends who are watching know, I have watched your series so many times and all the series. It's just, it's a comfort watch for me at this point. I'll like put it on when I'm cooking in the house or when I'm working at my desk, I have it, I'll just have it playing. Um, but so many times you're just cleaning your bench and there's nothing to be cleaned. You're just moving the towel across the bench. Well, that's the other thing. I always had a clean bench because, because I had more time and the show doesn't show it. The way they do the edit, they want to make it look like everyone's pushing till the end. Right. Um, but sometimes you're not. And I, when you want to go and help people, like your thing is, oh, I want to go and help that person, but actually they don't let you do that very often. They want to let that, they'll let it happen sometimes. So it's part of a storyline they want. But it's that for a very practical reason is they cut different things at different times with the edit. And it makes it very complicated for the people editing. If there's always different people over at other people's benches all the time, they want to be able to use shots whenever they want to be able to use them. Um, so yeah, they, they if you go and try and help, often they'll be like, no, nope, David, go back to your bench. Because <laughs> also you don't realize there are so many people in that tent. Down the center of the tent, there's pretty much a hundred people there at any one time. You're not, it makes it look like we're just like on our own at our bench. And all, yeah, the cameras just always face outwards along the benches. Um, and then only oh, yeah, about, they do. about two or three times in a challenge, someone makes a sign and all the people run to the front or they dive behind the benches and they take them wide angle shots so they can intersperse those throughout the footage. So it makes <laughs> it look like the tent is just the bakers. But actually, you know, there's people in your face and around you all the time. Wow. Well, thank you for that wow. insight. I feel like I'm in the know now. I'm um, you for helping. <laughs> <laughs> so that leads me, talking about your season, um, leads me to talking about Sticky Bun Boys, which is an utter delight. Listening to you and Michael be so sassy when you're analyzing a series. And then the absolute 
joy I get from listening to you give your advice to people who write in. It's so kind and it's so genuine. I mean, there were times I listen to it a lot when I'm walking through the neighborhood and there'll be like some particularly poignant moment and I'm trying not to tear up as I'm because I don't want to, you know, I want to pay attention to the traffic ahead of me. But it's just I love what you're doing with that community. It's a tough balance as well because it's it's a funny podcast and we don't get it. So like we, it sometimes throws on a bit where a question comes in that's a very serious question. And then we suddenly like take an about turn and we're like, we've just been joking and making fun of something. And then actually, no, this is a very serious question about relationships. I think for that, it's, we, we, we particularly like talking about relationship things because both Michael and I had both lived with so much shame to do with our sexual, sexuality, sex, relationships. And so much of that became came about with not talking about it, uh, which is very surprising because we're both very talkative people, but we were both crippled by shame and not talking about things and not sharing with other people. And so this podcast has just really, it's like us celebrating that freedom and trying to, yeah, let, let other people know like you can talk about things. These, these shouldn't be embarrassing things. These should be things that we can just talk about. And it lends itself so nicely because Bake Off is, bless it, it is full of innuendos. Mary Berry, I don't know what, she, I mean, she started it because we've gone back to watching the original series. Mary, she is naughty, like, without even realising. But, like, it's, because we've got another show called The Great Pottery Throwdown, which is like Bake Off but for pottery. And, again, pottery lends itself so well to innuendo. Um, but, yeah, so on, on Apple Podcasts, our podcast is actually rated as explicit, which it probably is, that's fair. Um, but, yeah, we do, we, we really enjoy it because we're wanting... In terms of, we, we try not to, we want to be honest, but we're wanting to build the bakers up who are on the show. We're not trying to kind of, because I've listened to some of the Bake Off things when I was on it as well. And people can be quite cruel. It's like, okay, that's entertaining, but it's not particularly friendly. Whereas we try to be honest, but still uh, nice to the bakers. Yes. So two things. One, <laughs> when it was shoe nut week and with Prue and George, <laughs> there might be kids know. watching this, so I'm not going to go into detail, but your discussion of it and then actually watching it again, I just, I howl with laughter every time now. Yeah. It's it's so funny, but that also, so that's going to give me a jumping off point because I'm a bookseller, so I always got to have books. You talked about social media and podcasts talking about bakers being cruel. To, for, for clickbait purposes. So this book is called Paris Delancourt is about to crumble and it's about a bake-off like show. And ah. one of the things uh, it's by Alexis Hall. And one of the things it talks about is mental health. And it also is interspersed with like Twitter after each episode drops. And it's so painful to to read but also to understand that the, there are people behind this like the, yeah. the bakers are real people yeah i think i'd find that book a bit triggering <laughs> i think you would too so i'm not recommending it to you it's more for the audience um but it's just it is very um as a bake-off fan i really enjoyed it but i think as a bake-off um participant you might not um, every single year on bake-off the production crew have to contact the police because of death threats at least at least once every single year. So like some bakers, I I had like I I found a lot of the Twitter abuse quite comical, and I would just like to respond by doing little kissy emojis and things like that. But some people found it difficult and had it really tough. Like Rosie and our year seemed yeah. to get a disproportionate amount of Twitter abuse, and it's not nice. It's horrible. Like it. And that there's that problem of people thinking, everyone knows, no one is pretending that they're all perfect and they don't watch these shows at home and say things that in their own privacy of their own living room to the TV, saying like, oh, I don't like that person, they should have gone home and things like that. That is private. But I think people, because people are sitting in their living room while they're typing into Twitter, they've kind of lost this thing of realizing what's public and what's private. It's absolutely fine to rant to your partner about this character on TV because like Bake Off David, for example, isn't me. That's like, that's the TV production company turned me into a kind of a character. Right. It's fine to do that. It's not okay 
to publicly announce something that I can read as the real David and take, you know, that that's abuse. So like, and I think that's why, that's the bit that I think people don't get that this, the difference between the private, sitting in your living room, shouting at the TV, absolutely fine. Say whatever you want. You can be, you can use expletives, whatever, but don't do it publicly and Twitter is public. Exactly. I just, uh, it, it, that is, you know, social media has been, wonderful in some ways to allow people to connect and share community but in other ways it it, it almost puts a, a a a wall down so people assume that they can say anything and they can't yeah it's just ugh. i have a question here from zayden who is eight years old and zayden would like to know when did you start the, how long did it take you to write your baking book Oh, interesting. Very good question. I love all these questions because I always love books my whole life. Um, but it's very, very interesting to learn how a book is published. And usually, as a general rule, you have finished writing the book probably almost a year before it gets published. Um, and then there's a lot of, there's a big process that gets to the publishing point, including usually like a six month, six month period for printing. Um, and for me, in terms of time it takes, it doesn't take me that long. This is why I wish that like the illustrator's name was bigger on the book than mine, because it definitely takes a lot more effort for the illustrator. Uh, I would say it takes me about two months if I'm giving a good chunk of time. Then the most difficult bit for me, well, not the difficult bit, because I enjoy it the most, but the bit finding the ideas is the is the bit that's really key. Because there's a million cookbooks out there. And you know, how many times do you need to have another chocolate cake? You've got to think of a twist on it or making it funny. And so I love thinking of all the ideas. Um, and then when it comes down to doing it, it probably takes about two months. Okay. Okay. Here's a question from Aiden and Evelyn, also kids. I think they're 12 and 10. What is your favorite thing to bake? Oh, bread. You'll see with these books, I don't shy. I think sometimes with, especially kids' books, people shy away from putting bread in there because it's a bit more, maybe slightly more technical and a bit more involved. I love bread and um, everything bread. So in this book in particular, I like the ice bear buns, which is like an ice bread bun with covered in coconut, so it makes it look like a fluffy polar bear. Uh, and I love, I love the um, the hot cross hedgehogs. Hedgehogs, well. the hot cross hedgehogs. Yes, There's so any. I love bread that has spices and fruits and things in it, which is great for this time of year as well. It absolutely is. Is there one spice? This is not a question from. This is a question from me. Is there one spice that is? you love to see in a bake or that you really enjoy using? At the I, I go through phases. I'm such a father. At the moment, I really like ground fenugreek. So ground fenugreek, when in a bake, like in a biscuit, it kind of gives a slight mapley taste, but still a curried taste as well. So yeah, I like ground fenugreek. But I do, I do love cinnamon. I know it's like so common, but cinnamon, there's a reason why it's so common and throughout so many bakes. Sweet cinnamon is delicious. Well, and it's also, it's, I mean, I don't know enough about fenugreek to speak on it, but cinnamon you find in cuisines around the world. Yes. Yeah. So there's got to be, I mean, there's a reason for that. Yeah. And I think fenugreek, fenugreek probably isn't as used as much. There's certain cuisines where it's celebrated a bit more. Um, but yeah, I'm going to try and change that. <laughs> so you like to use fenugreek. Do you, when you're baking or cooking, do you think, I'm guessing the answer is yes here, but because you're cooking, you're like, oh, I'm just going to throw in some fenugreek and see what happens. Yeah, I love experimentation. I love experimenting. I love reading about what other people are doing. And I love, I've, I've spent so long in other cult cultures around the world. I love all the culture of food and learning about cultures. But then experimentation is the most important thing. And I think that means being vulnerable enough to accept when it doesn't work as you were expecting it to. Yes, yeah, and be willing to still eat it. Yes. But I do, so you, going back to vulnerability, I just have to tell you that um, Brene Brown, who has raised, who has elevated vulnerability, lives in Houston, Texas. So just throwing that yeah. out for you. I am obsessed with Brene Brown. Well, I'd say that my husband, Nick, is like actually obsessed with her. Um, but yeah, she has, she's been the one that, her books given to me by Nick were the thing that changed 
me and like uh, making a big step forward in like vulnerability and shame. I think she is incredible. She is. She's amazing. She has shopped at the store. Uh, we've done events with her. She and she is as delightful as you would hope she would be. Yes. She she's just wonderful. And and okay. And so that jumps me off onto another thing. One of her close friends is a woman named Karen Walrand who just released a book last week called Radiant Rebellion, which is about aging and embracing aging rather than being ashamed of it or pushing back against it and avoiding talking about it, just fully leaning into it. So, and I'm just shouting that out more to my colleagues and the, or my friends who are watching online because it was, it's so good. And again, you know, just I, go ahead. I love that as well. I think that's one of the, that's one of my themes at the moment actually is I turned 40 this year, which isn't old, but it's definitely like a lot of my friends for a long time seem to have this thing where they're obsessed with not getting old. And then it's the, the whole thing of having Botox and fillers. And no, if anyone wants to do that, whatever you want, like do whatever you want. But I definitely am embracing, like I'm trying to have the mental thing of enjoying the idea of getting old and yes. celebrating. Like I, I personally don't want to use any of these things that makes you look, supposedly look younger for long, because I don't think it really works either. Um, but also having lived in lots of different countries, we do have this weird obsession with trying to cheat death or not like death, whereas other countries, people kind of celebrate it as just part of life. Yeah, and I think we could do better. And, and what's interesting, one of the interesting things, and I'm digressing here and I apologize, is that it's the anti-aging industry is massive now. Oh, yeah. So it's almost like it's an economic proposition to avoid aging. That's, oh, there's, you know, there's everything that becomes a becomes a fad, it's always got some billion dollar industry behind it, hasn't it? Yeah, which is disheartening, but it means even more just, you know, fight the good fight. So we are running close to the end of time, and I know it's the evening where you are. Um, are there any, I know you like to make book recommendations and podcast recommendations with Michael. Are, are there any that you would shout out to people who are watching right now? Oh, my my number one book from the last few years has been Shuggy Bane by Douglas Stewart. I absolutely, I mean, I lived in Scotland and it's just, oh, it just it absolutely brilliant. It gives me all the feels. Um, recent, this last year, the book I've enjoyed most has been Demon Copperhead. Yes, uh, Harper King Solver. Yes, so, so good. And oh, Nick, what was the Sackler one? Bacon. No. What's the one that's from the, about the Sackler family? Oh, something of pain. Yes. Oh. We Nick and I both just read that. It was brilliant. Whoever yes. that author is is such a good writer at making it very accessible. What was Empire of Pain? Yep. Yep. So, did you and Nick read um, Bad Blood by John Kerry Rue? No. So it's about the Theranos thing with Elizabeth Holmes. Oh yes, I because I remember listening to a podcast ages ago when that first came out i find that very interesting yeah so she what what's fascinating about the way john carrier tells it is he's the wall street journal reporter who broke the story and uh, so the first 60 percent of the book is him laying out what happened and the last 40 percent is her trying to stop him from okay. breaking the story and i listened to it and at one point I was I was driving somewhere and I did not want to get out of my car. I wanted to just keep going because I was so engrossed. You know, that's what I love now is I have always been a big reader. I love reading. Um, but I've got some friends that don't really listen to audiobooks. They seem to think it's not proper reading. I love audiobooks as well. To me, it just increases my reading. I get to have double the amount because, yeah, you, you listen to audiobooks while you're driving or while you go. I do when I'm going for a run and things. Um, so, yeah, big shout out for audiobooks. Absolutely. Absolutely. And friends who are watching, you all know, we love Libro.fm because they support independent bookstores. They are our dear friends, and you can learn more about that at Blue Willow Bookshop. Um, how about podcasts? Oh, which ones have I just listened to? Um, oh, I can't think. It's definitely so. Nick, what have you just been listening to on a podcast? Well, okay. But what was it called? Shiny Bob. Listen to one called Shiny Bob, which is a Scottish one. Um, okay. And it's just a brilliant, the, the narrator for that is absolutely brilliant. 
Amazing. Uh, oh, and the lowball tapes. The lowball tapes was a, a true crime you want to do with uh, a rate rigging scandal in the UK to do with finance. I love true crime. Not always, I think when people think about true crime, they're always thinking of murders. I actually quite like the ones, like there's one called Swindled, which is a US based one. Um, and it's often kind of corporate crime and things like that. I just love true crime, basically. What did I just listen to? Oh my gosh. I can't remember. I'm forgetting the name of it. It was called Empire State of Crime. And it's part of a it's part of a podcast series. Um, and I'll put it in the I'll put it in the email that I sent out to all of y'all. But it was about the New York legislature, the state legislature, and how corrupt it was. It was unbelievable. And again, I didn't want to get out of the car. I particularly like true crime ones when at least when people go to jail, because so often people get away with it and end up with these billions. But I love the ones that particularly when people get their comeuppance. Yes, I completely agree with you. And the, I I think you would like this one. I mean, it is very America focused, but it is um, it's very well produced. They even have like uh, voice actors and they pull actual um, audio footage from news reports and press re and press conferences. It was really fascinating. Nice. So when I remember it, I will do it. Um, one other one I would throw out to you, it is not true crime, but it is um, called Vibe Check with three amazing American uh, authors, Saeed Jones, Zach Stafford, and Sam Sanders. Their level of sass approaches <laughs> yours and Michael's level of sass. And it's more social commentary, but the tone is about the same. Nice. I'll definitely should listen to that. Yes, I will add that. But David, thank you for everything you do. Thank you for all the different, for the kids' cookbooks, for the for the podcast, for just your presence on social media and your candor um, moving through life. You are moving through life in a way that is quite inspirational. Thank you so much. And thank you for running an independent bookshop. Like I say, I, I'm way more into books than I am into TV. Uh, and I still love going into any kind of independent bookshop and browsing the aisles. Like I, I, there was a time when everyone thought that when eBooks first came out that uh, the traditional books were going to be dead. And I love the fact that they're still celebrated and they're not going anywhere. We are not going anywhere. I can tell you that. So if you ever find yourself in Houston, Texas, which is an amazing food town, you come and see us and we'll find some books for you and Nick. Yes, definitely. All right. Have a good evening. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye.